Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Scotland, episode 25, Duncan II versus Donald III. So today, I have some bad news. Well, this month, along with the rewrites of episodes 1 to 7, I'm going on holiday. Twice, in fact. One next week for five days, and then the other at the end of the month for ten days. Sadly, this does mean this month I'm only going to be able to release two episodes. I know this sucks, but we all need a holiday every now and again, and in my case, <laughs> I do need to. So, after today's episode, I'll only be doing one more episode this month. That episode is episode 26, 11th Century Warfare. When I return in September, along with the re-recorded new episodes, I will return to normal scheduling with the three episodes released a month. My goal is for us to reach the start of the famous Scottish succession crisis by the start of next year. Will I reach it by then? Who knows, but it is my goal either way. Last time, we finally closed the book on Malcolm III and Queen Margaret. I have to say, pondering over it over the past week, I really will miss both rulers, as not only have they been a part of our story for so long, but they really were great Scottish monarchs, who helped bring Scotland to a worldwide stage with their piety and reforms to the kingdom. With their death came a small family civil war between the sons of Malcolm III and his brother, the last surviving son of Duncan I, Donald III. If you remember from last time, Donald, at the death of Malcolm III at the Siege of Alnwick, headed home with a Scottish band of warriors to take the throne for himself. He besieged Edinburgh whilst Malcolm's sons were weeping over the death of their mother, Margaret. Edgar, brother to Margaret and uncle to her children, managed to escape the castle along with the sons of Malcolm and headed towards the English court to meet with the English king and their eldest brother, the first son of Malcolm III with his first wife, Duncan, who currently, if you remember, was being held sort of hostage here after the peace treaty with William Rufus. When they arrived at the court of the English king, they met and began plotting their revenge. For Duncan the eldest brother, and Norman Knight to come to the throne. So, today, let's jump into this feud between the two parties. Will the sons of Malcolm win back the throne for their eldest brother, Duncan? Or will Donald, the semi-usurper, hold on to it? Let's go ahead and find out. Let's break down our two protagonists, starting with the usurper, Donald III, the brother of our late Malcolm III. Donald was born about 1033 AD, during the reign of his great-grandfather, King Malcolm II. He was the second known son of the king's grandson, Duncan. Malcolm II died when Donald was a baby, at the age of 80, and Donald's father became king. King Duncan I, however, perished in 1040 when Donald was still a boy, killed by our famous and one of my favourite kings of Scotland now, Macbeth who usurped his place as king. Following his father's death, Donald went into hiding in Ireland for 17 years for fear that he would be killed by Macbeth. His elder brother, Malcolm, went to England as we know. It was during this time that Malcolm's grandfather, Sinan of Dunkeld, who was married to Malcolm II's daughter, was f killed fighting Macbeth. When Malcolm grew to manhood, he overthrew Macbeth and became the new king we all know and loved. Donald was 25 years old at that time. Donald's activities during the reign of his elder brother Malcolm III are not recorded. It appears that he was not his brother's chosen heir, contrary to the earlier custom, but that Malcolm had designated Edward, as we know, the person who ended up dying at the Battle of Alnwick. Obviously, if this was Malcolm's intent to have Edward crowned as well, the battle did kind of skew things a bit in Northumbria, and this confounded all the plans that he had laid. These deaths were followed very soon afterwards, as we know, by the death of Queen Margaret. And if we look at Donald's time before we went to the siege of Alnwick, he didn't go to the court in Edinburgh. He didn't, I mean, there's no historical record that designates him at the court. So we have to presume he was out somewhere plotting either in Cumbria, towards the Strathclyde Islands. Either way, he was not at the king's court. He wasn't helping Malcolm take on the English. He wasn't helping reform the court. He wasn't even part of the court. So we have to believe he was planning behind the scenes, getting ready for some type of Game of Thrones backstab we all hate. John of Thorndon reports that Donald invaded the kingdom after Margaret's death, 
at the head of a numerous band as we know, and laid siege to Edinburgh with Malcolm's sons by Margaret inside. Fawndon has Edgar the Etheling, concerned for his nephew's well-being, take the sons of Malcolm and Margaret to England. Andred of Winton's much simpler account has Donald become king and banish the nephews, and the Anglo-Saxon records only that Donald was chosen as king and expelled the English from the court, but as I said last time, we can maybe put the English as the sons as well, considering the sons were very English not only in name, but in their upbringing from Margaret as well. If we now transition our perspectives over to the English court and Malcolm's eldest son with his first wife Duncan, the heir apparent since Edward, Malcolm's designated heir, died along with his father. Duncan was the eldest son of Malcolm III, but his mother was not Margaret, but instead the widow of the former Earl of Orkney, that far and the mighty. Very little is known about her, and she is thought to have died early in during Malcolm's reign. Later, Scottish chroniclers questioned the legitimacy of this marriage, and William of Malmesbury called Duncan a bastard. However, this is almost certainly explained by a bias towards the sons of Margaret, who face rebellion from Duncan's descendants, and modern historians do not question Duncan's legitimacy. Reminding you all, Thorin the Mighty, this Earl of Orkney, was the Earl that sided with Macbeth that overthrew Duncan I, Malcolm III's mother. So what we can bring together is Malcolm clearly married the widow, widow of the Earl of Orkney to kind of solidify his rule, make sure there weren't any further rebellions that his father Duncan had faced. This still leaves the question of why Duncan was not Malcolm III's obvious heir in 1093 though. In part, this can be explained by the circumstances of his upbringing. In 1072, Malcolm III was forced to make peace with William the Conqueror at Abernethy, which included him handing over his eldest son, Duncan, who was at the time about 12 years old, as a hostage. We went over this a couple of episodes ago. Duncan's status as a hostage was not that of a young boy chained up in a dungeon, but rather a privileged guest who was brought up as part of the family. Consequently, he was raised as a Norman knight. Check out our History of the Normans episode to learn more about life as a Norman knight. But he was being fl taught fluent in French, court, culture, cavalry, everything that came with the Norman knight lifestyle. When William Rufus succeeded his father as king in 1087, Duncan was released but chose to remain in Normandy, where he was knighted by Rufus's brother, Robert, Duke of Normandy, Robert Curtos, that famous English crusader. Duncan pointedly did not return to Scotland and may have been seen as going native by his father. He would have probably have been under pressure from his wife to promote the claims of her sons over those from a previous marriage. Regardless of Duncan's relationship with his father, in 1093 he was physically abstinent from Scotland and in no place to make any immediate challenge for the throne. However, he had an ally in the form of William Rufus. Rufus had been at odds with Malcolm III over the English-Scotland border for many years, and the last thing he wanted was to see another Celtic king with an aggressive outlook. Just a sidebar a sec, we are going to be doing a future episode on the England-Scotland border wars. I'm trying to think when the best time to do this is, considering the border wars last from around 1100 to about the 1500s until James I comes to the throne. So it lasts for maybe over 400 years. So I might choose a middle point in history and maybe do like a free four part episode where we go over the entire 400 years of the borderlands history, talking about the key families that were involved in these wars. But we'll leave that for the future. So for now, all we need to be concerned about is the English-Scottish border was filled with warring families on either side, some that did intermarry but were very powerful and were responsible for keeping the borders safe for their respective rulers. Duncan's suitability as an alternative ruler for Scotland was cemented by his reputation as a respected knight with military experience in Normandy, meaning he could lead his own campaign without Rufus having to get his hands dirty. Initially, however, William was busy with other campaigns, and although Duncan gave him an oath of fealty in return for recognition as king, Rufus was not able to spare any resources to provide practical assistance. Thankfully, Duncan was resourceful enough that he was able to marry, manage his own affairs, and by marrying Octreda, the daughter of Gospatric, a former Earl of Northumbria, he was able to raise an army in Northumbria, 
Thus, in 1094, he marched north. We know very little of what Donald was like as a king, because the next few years were dominated by conflict with Donald and his nephews, all of which was directed by the English king William Rufus, as we learnt earlier. Duncan had never been back to Scotland as well, and was maybe a respected figure at the Anglo-Norman court. Crucially, he also recognised Rufus as his superior, so eventually in 1094 he was given an army and set off to Scotland with his combined Northumbria host that he had raised in the north. Frustratingly though, we don't know whether any battles were fought, but Duncan succeeded in taking the throne with Donald retreating to the Highlands. So what we can think about in this is as soon as Duncan arrived with a mass host of Norman, Anglo-Saxon and English warriors to Scotland, Donald hightailed it and ran. He would not have had the force to take on a combined English, exiled Scottish and Anglo-Saxon army. There simply wouldn't have been the manpower for that. So the idea of retreating to the Highlands as a English style army invaded took place here in the early days and this is what Donald did. He retreated to the Highlands where he could commit to a guerrilla style warfare but more importantly be safer in any pitched battles that he would surely lose against the well-trained Norman army. And obviously Duncan being a trained military commander he was probably wary of that as well. Duncan came to the throne and was crowned Duncan II. Duncan issued a charter at Durham declaring himself undoubted king of Scotia and he expelled Donald III and became king in May. Whether Donald left the region or was still loose in the highlands we do not know. Unfortunately things got difficult rather quickly for Duncan. He had not been in Scotland since 1072 when he was a wee chapper and came to the throne at the head of an Anglo-Norman army to a country which had recently chosen a king specifically because he was not Anglo-Norman. What's more, Donald III was still on the loose in the Highlands. Not surprisingly, Duncan was soon facing rebellions, one of which destroyed his military retinue and in order to reach an accord with his enemies he agreed to send his foreign troops home which was going to be a big mistake, and this played right into Donald's hands. Donald was not alone. Somehow he had made contact with Margaret's eldest surviving son, Edmund, and a murky deal was agreed between uncle and nephew. Donald remained king, but Edmund seems to have been given Strathclyde to rule as an appanage and was almost certainly recognised as Donald's heir. It is not clear how the working relationship operated in practice, but king lists do not usually acknowledge Edmund as being king, so the assumption is that Donald remained king in his own right rather than sharing the throne. So before we get to the actual showdown between Duncan and Donald, let's set the scene a bit more. We currently have Donald, with the eldest son of Margaret and Malcolm's son Edmund, in the Highlands gathering their Scottish warriors ready to take on Duncan. Duncan, who had actually sent his foreign troops home. But who were these foreign troops? Let's have a look. By 1094, Duncan was leading a sizeable army, consisting of mercenary knights and infantry. Many of these soldiers probably came from Northumbria, reflecting the familiar association of Duncan to Gospatric. In the early summer of this campaign, as we know, Duncan led his army in the invasion of Scotland. Donald tried to mobilise his supporters and troops in response. The early phase of the war took place in June, resulting in a victory for Duncan. Donald was forced to retreat towards the Scottish Highlands. And then Duncan was crowned at Scone. But his support and authority probably did not extend north of the River Forth. So Scotland is currently spit, split. His continued power was reliant on the presence of his Anglo-Norman allies, but more importantly, these troops that he brought with him. The continued presence of this foreign occupation army was naturally resented by much of the local population. Duncan himself had spent most of his time abroad, and he was an outsider to them. Months into the reign, landowners and prelates rose against the Normans, the occupation army fared poorly against a series of ongoing raids, and Duncan was only able to maintain the throne by negotiating with the rebels. He agreed to their terms and sending away the foreign supporters back to William Rufus. Sending away his troops backfired though. The showdown was about to happen. 
The lowland rebels seem to have ceased activities, but Donald had spent the intervening months rebuilding his army and political support in the highlands. Donald led his army to the lowlands and confronted his nephew. On the 12th of November, Duncan was ambushed and killed in battle, having reigned for less than seven months. Primary sources are unclear about the exact manner of his death. The Annals of Innsfallen report that Duncan, son of Malcolm, King of Alba, was slain by Donald, son of Duncan. That same Donald, moreover, afterwards took the kingship of Alba. The Annals of Ulster report that Duncan, son of Malcolm, King of Scotland, was treacherously killed by his own brothers, Duncan and Edmund. As Duncan had no brothers by those names, the text probably points to his uncle, uncle Donald and his half-brother Edmund, as we earlier suggested had been working with Donald to actually bring Donald back to the throne. But regardless of how he died, what we do know is Duncan was murdered by the wickedness of his uncle. Florence of Worcester reported that Duncan was killed, but never states who killed him. In the Chronicle of the Picts and Scots, there is a 13th century recording that Duncan was killed by Melpeder through the treachery of Donald. John of Forden, our trusty chronicler, finally recorded the better known account of the event that Duncan was slain at Montchain by the Earl of Mearns through the methods of his uncle Donald. Regardless, there are two contradictory accounts about the burial place of Duncan II. One reports him being buried at Dunfelm Abbey, and the other at the Isle of Iona. Regardless, Duncan II, a Norman knight, a man with military experience, made a strategic error. Yes, he had the martial skill. Yes, he had the leadership presence. Yes, he even probably could command an army well in the battle. But what he did not get or understand was the Scottish political situation and this was his greatest weakness and this is what actually killed him in the end. He could have been one of the greatest rulers Scotland had due to his martial prowess but his lack of knowledge of the Scottish court, the Scottish warring clans, how the Scottish court had been changed into this anglo scotto court but that change had actually alien alienated a lot of the Pictish nobility. It was a recipe for disaster for an alien to come to the throne in the first place. Inevitably however this didn't go down well with the English king William Rufus or with Edmund's younger brothers as well. Ed Edmund's younger brothers helped Duncan come back to the throne they saw his brother as a great warrior and a great succession to Malcolm III. So seeing their brother, their eldest brother, betray them, become a traitor, especially after Donald kicked them out of Edinburgh just as they were mourning the death of their mother. So this was the greatest crime you could commit. Your mother who you were mourning you were kicked out and you couldn't mourn properly and the person responsible for kicking you out and taking the throne that was in effect rightfully yours if we're looking at the new succession laws was donald and now your oldest brother is now siding with him out of a lust for power it didn't sit right with edmund's younger brothers i won't hammer the fact any further home but let's just put it this way they weren't happy william rufus weren't happy so Taking advantage of the superfluity of Scottish princes at his disposal, Rufus now acknowledged the next eldest brother, Edgar, the same Edgar that was at the battle and siege of Alnwick with his uncle, Edgar the Ethelin, sent them both off. What I mean by both is both Edgar and Edgar Ethelin, so let's not get confused. We've got Edgar, the king of Scotland, and Edgar Ethelin, the brother of Margaret, their uncle, sent them off with an army that was actually, to be fair, to be commanded by Edgar the Ethelin. A man's life that has definitely gone on for far too long. Thinking of where he started and how he was a claimant to the English throne, he is now commanding an, an army to invade Scotland to avenge not only his sister but his nephews. It's a really great story, isn't it? And I really would suggest looking at the Anglo-Saxon England podcast to learn more about that. Anyway, once again, the invasion was successful, but this time Donald and Edmund were captured. 
Edmund, who was currently the eldest out of Malcolm and Margaret's currently surviving sons, obviously Edward previously having died at the siege, was pursued and sent to be a monk in Somerset, while Donald was kept imprisoned in Scotland. If we look at Edmund's life here onwards, he disappears from our narrative and really disappears from history. He decided to throw his dice in with Donald, and if I'm honest, he wasn't rewarded very well. He threw his dice in, he lost, and due to his betrayal on his brothers and his uncle, he was rewarded with a kind of easy way out. You know, it wasn't a punishment of such, you just became a monk in Somerset. So, regardless, his life vanished from our tale. But Donald, <laughs> Donald's carry carried on. I'm sure Malcolm would have been less than impressed with his son so far, but with Edgar coming to the throne, maybe that would change. Oddly, Edgar seems to have spared Donald's life for a time until 1099 AD, when he was caught plotting while Edgar was out of the country, and finally his luck had run out. He was blinded and died shortly afterwards. Finally, Duncan I's sons have now died as well, and we're finally moving on to the next line of our heroes, Malcolm III's sons. So, that was it. Two kings in very fast succession. I went a bit off script quite a few times, you could probably tell, but I really wanted to expand on some of the parts that weren't really told in the historical record to give you an idea and to at least make a cohesive story the best I can. So I do apologise if it's a bit all over the place, but it's really hard to do two kings at once over such a small period of time. But I hope you got the picture. In short, this is how it goes. Donald comes to the throne, Duncan II invades, kicks Donald off the throne, everyone hates Duncan because he's an Englishman effectively, they then kick him back off the throne, he dies, Donald then becomes king again, his brothers are mad at the fact and so is William Rufus, send another army to invade, except this time they manage to capture Donald and their eldest brother Edmund, they banish Edmund to be a monk in Somerset to disappear from history and they keep Donald alive until he starts plotting again and when he does start plotting again he gets blinded and then died shortly afterwards due to his wounds. I know that was a lot faster than the past 15 minutes but I'm not going to do a podcast that's 15 seconds long so I apologise but I am always going to go in depth with these stories. Anyway, sadly their feud isn't in as much detail as we would have wanted regardless. Let's try and wrap these rules up with an overview of them as a person regardless. Let's start with Duncan the second first and then Donald the third. So starting with Duncan, on paper Duncan had the makings of a great warrior king. He was raised as a Norman knight, was thought to have taken part in campaigns in Normandy and seems to have been a well respected figure. Certainly he was trusted enough by Rufus to raise his own army and lead it in person and successfully take the throne in Scotland. His half-brother Edgar would see Rufus appoint his namesake uncle to lead the army instead which shows the difference of military prowess between our next king Edgar and the previous earlier Duncan II. Sadly, we have very little detail of anything Duncan II did by the way of battles, including how he took the throne. It may simply be that, boosted by an Anglo-Norman army, he had sufficient strength in number for Donald to retreat without a battle being necessary, and that's the style I have gone for in this episode. On paper, Duncan II had the makings of an excellent leader in battle, and his ability to take the throne in 1094 suggests that he knew what he was doing. Unfortunately, we have very little evidence of actual successes in battle, and his legacy of acknowledging the superiority of the English king was very damaging to the Scottish kingship. Impressively, Duncan II's charter issued at Durham on his way to taking the Scottish throne is actually the earliest surviving charter in Scottish history issued by a king. In it, he declares his right to kingship and gives lands to the monks of Durham, which was clearly appreciated as they were the ones who recorded the exact date of his death, indicating that he must have been considered an important figure. This is the charter. I... Duncan, son of King Malcolm and manifest King of Scotland by inheritance, having given in alms to St Cuthbert and his servants. Despite having been absent from Scotland since 1072 before heading north, Duncan seems to have made the effort to get on good terms with his half-brothers. He granted lands to Dunfermline Priory, founded by Margaret, and makes specific reference to his brothers in the charter. 
I have given these things for myself and for the soul of my father and for my brothers and for my wife and for my children. And since I wish this gift to be enduring to St. Cuthbert, I obtain the consent of my brothers. This suggests Duncan II had the capacity to be a diplomatic monarch who was willing to work with his brothers, making the betrayal of Edmund all the more shocking. However, good on paper Duncan might have been, he clearly was not who the Scots wanted to be king. His reign was brief, marked first by a rebellion and then by his own assassination from a foreign usurper only able to rule by virtue of a foreign army. The Chronicle of Melrose rather damningly concluded that because he lived badly, the whole populace crushed him. Though perhaps more likely is the assessment of George Buchan that being a military man and not so skilled in the arts of peace, he failed to even really win popular acceptance, meaning that the internal conflict would continue. Duncan II may have been a well-measured and well-meaning individual who could have been a good ruler, but he never managed to win the acceptance of his people, or at least his court, and consequently offered very little other than a foreign invasion and a charter issued in Durham, not actually in Scotland. Duncan did have one surviving child, William Fitz Duncan. He became a prominent and respected figure during the reigns of Duncan's younger half-brothers, largely because he did not challenge them for the throne. Sadly, Duncan III had the promise to be a significant and successful king, but instead his reign represents a tiny blip in the course of Scottish history, and it would be for his brothers to take the battle to Donald III. And obviously Edmund as well. (laughs) If we now move on to Donald, we know nothing of what Donald got up to prior to 1093, but the next few years were very busy. Despite being out of the country for over 50 years and facing numerous royal princes, he succeeded in winning the throne. Some have suggested he was aided by the King of Norway, who was looking to extend his influence in the Scottish Isles, but there's no firm evidence of this. According to John of Forden, he besieged his nephews in Edinburgh, and the rest is history. Winning the throne twice is impressive, but losing it twice is perhaps rather damning. The evidence seems to suggest more that Donald sneakily took advantage of weakness and power vacuums and came up short whenever faced with a real army. Not a man to cross, but also not one to fear in a fair fight. Donald has rather more going for him on his front. He seems highly unlikely that he was the intended heir in 1093, and he could not simply have turned up unannounced and taken the throne, suggesting that he had plenty of contacts at court and had been planning for this opportunity for some time. His prolificity for plotting shows again in 1094 when he made a deal with one nephew, Edmund, which involved murdering another Duncan II. It is even suggested he was plotting against Edgar from prison in 1099, which led to his blinding and death. In the context of medieval Scottish history up to this point, killing off your rivals is actually such an unusual thing. In fact, it's almost standard practice that you would expect to find in the handbook. His brother, Malcolm III, had killed two of his predecessors as we went over last time. The oldest, whom Macbeth had killed their father, Duncan I. And we already know about the wars of Constantine's succession as well. So as such, Donald's actions do not really stand out as spectacularly scandalous. The only thing that can really be said in Donald's favour is that for at least he was popular at court. The fact that he was chosen as king in 1093, despite there being so many sons of Malcolm III to choose from, indicates that he met with the approval of at least some of his subjects. That he was able to return so soon after his initial deposition in 1094 gives further credence to this idea of a Gaelic reaction and suggests that Donald was not all bad when it came to the business of kinging. On the other hand, there really is no evidence that he was actually any good as a king. It is likely that the 1093 to 1097 period involved a lot of upheaval and military activity, even if there were no grand battles. After three decades of stability under Malcolm III, this constant infighting would have been bad for the people and undermined Scotland's strength as a nation, and to be fair, it was essentially Donald's fault. It is also uncertain to what extent we can say he was really so very Scottish in identity. His exile and upbringing seems to have been in Norse-controlled territories, and the sense of a Gaelic reaction is perhaps easy to exaggerate. It is unlikely that there were swarves of Saxons abundant in Scotland, more likely a small but powerful faction at the court who were expelled in what may be more about personal loyalty than national identity. Some people may have wanted him to be king, but he did not do a very good job at it, 
and dragged Scotland back into a period of internal fighting and dynastic uncertainty that seemed to have become overcome by Malcolm III previously. Donald had no sons, which adds credence to the idea he had acknowledged his nephew Edmund as heir. However, he did have one daughter, Befeck, whose descendant John would actually make a claim to the throne in 1291. But that is for a future tale, dear listeners. Well, that is us closing the book on two of Scotland's shortest lived kings, Donald III and Duncan II. Yes, I could have probably split this into two episodes and maybe dragged it out a bit more, but I didn't really want to, want to hammer that home. Considering the reigns were so short-lived, I thought it would be quite pointless to split them over two episodes and kind of bore you to death with these kings that really didn't make much of an impact on Scottish history. So, you've got the long episode where I have failed to keep to my episode length limit again. I'm sorry, I am, but sometimes... This is going to happen. And if I'm honest, this won't be the last time it will happen as well. But I do apologise for the long episode, but we really need to get through both of these reigns, in my opinion. I am rather disappointed in Duncan II, particularly, as he did not amount to much. He really is an interesting character. He was held hostage in England. He became a Norman knight serving with Robert Curtos, And finally fought and won the throne back for himself in Scotland. I feel like you could write a book on his story, but sadly no one back then dedicated the time to doing that, which is certainly a shame with the lack of information we have of his life. Sadly, something we learn throughout Scottish history is the disdain for anything other than Scottish in the court of Scotland. That was Duncan's downfall, but he wouldn't have been the last to experience this. This is something David I would have to fight for throughout his reign, but he has to be said he was a lot more successful at it than Duncan, as we will soon find out. Well, next time we'll begin the reign of Edgar, son of Malcolm and Margaret, the first of the three brothers coming to the throne. His reign is going to be rather short again, so sadly, like today, I'll only be able to fill one episode with his reign. But don't worry, episodes after that will be a two-part episode on the First Crusade special, where we go over the First Crusade and Scotland's participation in it. And then finally, after Edgar and the Crusade, we get to David the First reign. And let me tell you, as you probably know with my hints, he will change all of Scotland for well, in his opinion, the better. And I have four to five episodes planned just for David I himself, so we can get back to more detail in our king's lives and stretch them over many episodes like we have done with Malcolm and Margaret. As mentioned in the last episode as well, please give the Anglo-Saxon England podcast a listen if you wish to learn more about Edgar's and Margaret's family and people's history. This is a great podcast for any early medieval history lovers out there, especially those interested in the Anglo-Saxon England history. Thank you again to everyone for the continued support on this series. If you have the time, please also follow our Twitter at the History of SC1 or just type in the History of Scotland. We also have a Facebook group called The History of Scotland if you wish to discuss the episodes with myself with any feedback and comments head there. Also, quick note, we have hit 61 reviews on Spotify, which is really insane. 61 reviews with a 4.9 average rating. That is brilliant. It's 4.9 out of 5, not out of 10. <laughs> but it's awesome to see so many people enjoying Scottish history. I'm enjoying telling it yeah, and I'm really glad you're enjoying learning it as well. And I'm looking forward to redoing some of the earlier episodes to get them in line with the production value I would say these latest episodes have started to take upon and give you a chance to go learn the earlier Scottish history that I did in 2020 a bit better with a lot more information and well structured. As always, any corrections or issues with this podcast, please let me know at the History of Scotland podcast at gmail.com. That is History of Scotland podcast at gmail.com. Please re- leave a review if you can, and our podcast is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, and many other great podcasting sites. Next podcast will not be next week, but the week after, as I am on holiday, as I mentioned. So until then, stay safe, have a great couple of weeks, guys, and I'll catch you all on the next one. Peace. Peace.